good afternoon friends what i am going to tell you is about the deep vein thrombosis and its association with thrombophilia <clears throat> now thrombophilia is the term used to describe predisposition to an increased risk of venous and occasionally arterial thromboembolism owing to the hematological abnormalities though we define the term thrombophilia even if you make a diagnosis of thrombophilia but there is no treatment for thrombophilia we only treat whenever there is complications because of thrombophilia which means the patient has got like the venous thrombosis is there that we are going to treat but otherwise the thrombophilia as such cannot be treated now if you look at the dvt it can be a provoked dvt or unprovoked dvt provoked means that it has occurred after some provocation while unprovoked is without any provocation and it has been found that if the patient has a dvt which is because of provoked dvt the usual anticoagulation is given for about 3 months but if it is a unprovoked dvt is there then in that case we have to give this patient the anticoagulation for a longer period or even sometimes a lifelong because if we look at the provoked and unprovoked dvt there is a risk of recurrence is there so if somebody has got a dvt after the major surgery or a trauma or immobility or hospitalization the chance of recurrence is less than 1% but if the same has occurred in a unprovoked situation means these provoking factors are absent then it may be even up to 40 to 50% you know there are different types of thrombophilic conditions which may be a hereditary or it can be acquired one now in the group of the hereditary the factor 5 laden the prothrombin gene mutation which may be of heterozygous variety or the homozygous variety or there can be a anti thrombin deficiency the protein c and protein s deficiency factor 8 factor 9 factor 11 overactivity is there or the patient has the hyperhomocysteinemia or dysfibrinogenemia is there or in the acquired group the commonest is the anti phospholipid syndrome but otherwise there are several things which can lead to acquired thrombophilia like somebody has got a cancer has got a myeloproliferative disorder and the hemoglobinemia is there nephrotic syndrome inflammatory bowel disease so all they can produce the acquired type of thrombophilia so what is the classical thrombophilia you know there are so many factors which are there which cannot be looked after but in the hereditary group you can see for the factor 5 laden and the prothrombin gene mutation or it can be anti thrombin deficiency the protein c and protein s deficiency and in the acquired group mainly anti phospholipid syndrome now when do you suspect a patient has got a thrombophilia if your patient is a young patient less than 40 to 50 years if there is a strong family history is there if it has occurred in the younger age group with a very weak provoking factor or the patient had a recurrent vt again and again or it is at unusual sites that like it has occurred in the brain it has occurred in the flanking circulation or in the retinal vein then you have to suspect the patient might be having thrombophilia Now, as such, if you look at the frequency of the thrombophilia, outside the setting of surgery, trauma, or cancer, it's approximately twenty-five percent, and it can occur either alone or along with the acquired risk factor, and that significantly increases the risk of the venous thrombosis. Currently, available thrombophilia tests are insufficient to identify the inherited risk of VT. Therefore, if you find it's a negative test, doesn't mean that the patient is not having the thrombophilia so what is the prevalence of the thrombophilia if you look at the factor 5 laden which is measured by the activated protein c resistance 
in the white population is around 5%. But if you look at the Asian population, in our population, it is less than 1%. So it is not very common. Similarly, the prothrombin gene mutation is more common in the whites. It is not in the Asians. Protein C, protein S, and antithrombin, the overall prevalence is less than 0.5%. And in the acquired group, mainly the APLA variety, which is there, that also range in the range of 0 to 5%. Now, if in a general population and in a patient who had the DVT, that population, if you see that how much is the inherited thrombophilia, so antithrombin, protein C, and protein S deficiency, which is there, is 1% in general population. While if somebody had a history of DVT, it's around 7%. Factor 5 laden, it's around 21%. Prothrombin mutation in 6%. High level of the factor 8C in 25%. And some of the hyperhomocysteemia, which is there, which may be much more common in the general population as compared to the thromboembolic population. So overall, all these factors which are there, factor 5 laden, protein, prothrombin gene mutation, protein C, protein S, antithrombin deficiency which is there. They are quite rare in the Asian population and even much rarer in the African population. But we carried out a study about 10 years back where we looked into the activated protein C resistance in the deep vein thrombosis, and we found that we tested in about 23%. Almost about 43% of the patient, they were positive for the APC resistance. So I think we have to look into this scenario that is the APC resistance, what we say that is very low, or the factor 5 laden, very low. Is it really low in our population? That has to be seen, and I think it will require more studies to confirm that what is the real prevalence of the APC resistance. So when you are testing for the thrombophilia, it is easy to that you can order okay, but to interpret that is also difficult. And majority of the time it is said that you do not require to carry out the test for the thrombophilia in majority of the settings of the DVD. So what test has to be done? You will do a complete blood count, prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplasin time, antithrombin assay, protein CSA, protein SSA. Look for the APC resistance, look for the factor 5 laden, look for the prothrombin mutation, and lupus anticoagulant, anti cardiolipin antibodies, and beta 2 glycoproteins. Now, this is very important. I think probably one of the most important things that when to do the testing. Never do this test at the time of the acute attack. If the patient had a VTE, at that time to do, is going to give you often the false positive. And second, if the patient is already on anticoagulation, then also please do not carry out the thrombophilia testing because it's going to give you a false reports. So if you have to do at the acute attack time, one you can do is the factor 5 laden or the prothrombin mutation can be carried out. But otherwise, the other factors which are there, like the antithrombin, protein C, protein S, extra, should not be carried out at the when you are giving the patient the anticoagulation. And there are a few recommendations that do not test at the time of the VTE. Do not test while the patient is receiving anticoagulant therapy. So the patient is taking a vitamin K, you have to at least stop that for two weeks, then only carry it out. If you, the patient is on the DOAX, the NOAX, then at least for two days. And if the patient is on the fractionated or unfractionated heparin, then it has to stop at least for 24 hours, then only carry out the test. If there is a strong risk factors are there, then it is not required to carry out the thrombophilia test. Consider the testing, as I told you, the strong family is there in the young patient that is there, or at the abnormal sites if it is there. Then in those cases, you do the testing for the thermophilia. And you have to identify what are the various goals that. Goals is that are you going to give the prolonged anticoagulation based on the thermophilia testing? And 
Are you going to test the family members for that? So all these things have to be taken into care when you are carrying out the testing for the pneumophilia. You know, it is good that you should carry out the risk stratification score. And there are several scores which are there. There's a DASH score based on the D-dimer, A, sex, and hormonal therapy status, or HERDO test, which is there based on the various other factors that you can decide that which this patient will require a prolonged anticoagulation or not. So this is a flow diagram. If you are seeing a patient, the first VT event, if it is probed by strong triggers, you do not require to do, carry out any testing. But if there's a weak trigger is there, then you have to require to carry out the certain test. Or if it is unprobed DVT is there, or at the unusual sites is DVT is there, then in those cases, definitely you have to carry out the testing for thrombophilia. Friends, finally, routine testing for the thrombophilia is not advised. Duration of anticoagulation may not be affected by the thrombophilia testing. And thrombophilia testing should not be done in acute episode and with the patient is on anticoagulation. Thank you very much.